Okay, thank you everyone for joining us today. Natera is excited to be able to present this webinar on carrier screening entitled Genetic Carrier Screening in the 21st Century, What Clinicians Need to Know. This will be a join-in presentation, so you will have the ability to answer questions that are asked during the webcast, as well as ask any questions you have about the webinar at the end. In order to ask questions, please type the questions in the lower right-hand corner of your screen where it says questions box, and at the end of the presentation, we'll answer what we can and what we have time for, and the questions that we don't get to, we will answer via email. There will also be live polling questions that come in throughout the webinar. These polling questions are for your participation so that you can see how you stack up against the audience. We're pleased to have two speakers for you today. The first speaker will be Dr. Adele Schneider, who is Director of Clinical Genetics at Albert Einstein Medical Center, is the Medical Director of the Victor Center for the Prevention of Jewish Genetic Diseases, and Professor of Pediatrics at Jefferson Medical College. Our second speaker today will be Dr. Susan Gross, who is Professor of Clinical Obstetrics and Gynecology and Women's Health in Pediatrics and Genetics at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and is the Chief Medical Officer at Natera. Our agenda today will be to discuss the Ashkenazi Jewish genetic diseases because it's more than Tay-Sachs with Dr. Schneider. To review the Horizon Carrier Screen, a responsible approach to offer, offering carrier screening with Dr. Gross, and then questions and answers. So to start, we will begin with our polling question, true or false, the best test for detecting Tay-Sachs carriers in all ethnicities is XA enzyme on blood. Please select your answer. And then in a moment, we'll reveal how everyone stacked up. So it appears that 60% said true. Hex A enzyme on blood is the best test for detecting Tay-Sachs carriers in all ethnicities. And to move forward, I'm going to hand the microphone back to Dr. Adele Schneider, who will begin her presentation today. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, and I look forward to discussing this with everybody. We're going to talk about Jewish genetic diseases. It's more than Tay-Sachs. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> the number that we have been using of late is that one in four Ashkenazi Jews is a carrier of a gene mutation and at least one of 19 diseases that has a high carrier rate in the Ashkenazi population. Next slide. The list of tests is as follows. You might look at that and say, well, spinal muscular atrophy is not a Jewish genetic disease. It is not. It's a common disease in all populations, but we lumped it in there because it's an important one to screen for, and it's not screened universally by everybody. So this list you'll be tested on later. Just kidding. Uh, next, please. <laughs> uh, these are the common diseases. But recently, next slide, please, something new happened. And, next slide please, now the number that is being quoted is one in two Ashkenazi Jews is a carrier of a gene mutation in at least one of 37 recessive diseases with a high carrier rate in Ashkenazi Jews. This was beautifully presented at the recent American College of Medical Genetics meeting uh, in Nashville by the lab at Mount Sinai. And the list that you can see here is the extra diseases that they have now studied, and uh, Dr. Gross will talk more about them. But this is what's now available for screening. Next slide, please. 
you might say, well, how come there are all these extra diseases? Do you just add them because you feel like adding them? And the reason is the, the answer is no. The diseases are selected because they're severe and they have a significant burden. They have a carrier frequency of 1% or higher and or the test detection rate is greater than 90%. So either one of those criteria can be fulfilled. And there needs to be benefit to knowing one's carrier status like Gaucher disease. Next slide, please. These diseases are all autosomal recessive diseases. And in this type of inheritance, we test because you can test a carrier and it doesn't affect their general health. Next slide, please. So in recessive inheritance, there's a one in four chance with every pregnancy of having an affected child if both parents are carriers for the same recessive disease. What is a carrier? A carrier is someone who carries a change or a mutation in the gene and causes it to malfunction. So the enzyme is produced in low amounts or not produced at all if one is affected, in which case there's excessive buildup of toxic substance in the blood, in the brain or other organs, resulting in symptoms of disease. Next slide, please. But a carrier has one of the genes working and one not working, which maintains their health. Uh, the gene that is working is producing enough enzyme for them to function normally. They are not at risk of developing the condition, and because a carrier is healthy, there's often no family history. Next slide, please. So who should, how do you find out if you're a carrier? There is carrier screening with a blood test, or the other option is to have an affected child, which is the most devastating way to find this out. Therefore, we have an obligation to screen and educate about these diseases in every generation. So who should be screened? Uh, young Jewish adults of reproductive age. Reproductive age seems to be getting higher and higher, so we generally focus on 18 to 44. Uh, before pregnancy is best, for many reasons, you can start with screening one member of a couple unless they're pregnant. If they're pregnant, they should both be tested at the same time. And if a person is married to a non-Jew, you screen the Jewish partner first. Next slide. So why is that the Ashkenazi Jews have been chosen to carry all these genes? In fact, it's not a terrible thing because the Jewish people at least are a group that know what to be tested for. So that knowledge actually empowers you. No one is perfect. All people are carriers of approximately 5 to 50 genes with mutations that could result in disease in certain circumstances. So the theories include selective advantage, which, for example, in Africa, people who are sickle cell carriers are not, sus not susceptible to malaria. There was a theory that Tay-Sachs gene carriers may have had increased resistance to TB, but it was never proved. Chance is one of the other causes, perhaps, and the founder effect. Next slide, please. The founder effect occurs when there's a high frequency of a specific gene mutation in a population that is founded by a small ancestral group. Can you click the next part of the slide? In this population, in the large population, initially there is one person who's a carrier who's an insignificant member of a large population. Then that population is decreased by perhaps disease, isolation, uh, migration. And the one carrier now has a much larger role to play in that small population. And after he has been fruitful and multiplied generations later, you will see many carriers. And that is one of the theories for the increase in these diseases in the Jewish population. You see that in the Amish population and other isolated populations. Next slide. So the origins of the Ashkenazi Jews are those of Eastern Europe, Germany, uh, Central Europe, and 90% of American Jews are of Ashkenazi Jewish origin. The rest are from the Sephardic or Mediterranean area, or Mizrahi mostly, they're Persian Jews. Next slide, please. So the question is, what if only one of us is of Ashkenazi Jewish descent? These conditions occur in the general population, but at a lower frequency. So you cannot ignore the fact that someone who is not Jewish could be a carrier for one of these. Certain ethnic groups have a higher frequency of some of these diseases. For example, the Cajun, French Canadian, and Irish have a higher incidence of Tay-Sachs disease. So the usual recommendation is to test the Jewish partner first, 
and test the non-Jewish partner later if the Jewish partner is a carrier, that can be fairly complicated. So a genetic counselor would be helpful to, to do that. The next slide, please. Who is Ashkenazi enough to be, be screened? So anybody of Eastern and Central European, European origin with one Jewish grandparent. So you can't go by Jewish last names anymore. It could be any last name and the knowledge that they have a Jewish grandparent. And our premise is, when in doubt, we screen. Uh, next slide, please. What's also important to note is that the panels keep changing. So a patient who's had one baby may come in a few years later and needs to get more diseases tested for. But you only need to test for the newer diseases on the panel, not the ones previously tested, because genes don't change. So it doesn't help to repeat the old test. It's now easy for labs to add mutation to chips at very little extra cost. Uh, next slide, please. So why should we screen? Because with the new panel, one in two Ashkenazi Jews is a carrier for at least one of these 37 diseases on the new panel that is becoming available now. The knowledge of carrier status empowers people to make educated decisions about family planning. And if two carriers for the same disease have children together, there's a one in four chance with each pregnancy of having an affected child. As I said, there are two ways to find out if you're a carrier, have a blood test or have an affected child. Next slide, please. Carriers are healthy, <clears throat> so they usually have no health implications for the person who is getting screened. And since Tay-Sachs screening was started in the 1970s, the number of Jewish babies born with Tay-Sachs has decreased by 90%. Since screening for familial dysautonomia started in 2001, the number of children born with FD is also decreasing. Babies with Tay-Sachs are being born predominantly to non-Jewish people now, and it's occurring in the Irish population in larger numbers for some reason. Next slide, please. What if I'm Sephardic? In the Sephardic people, the risk is different, and the diseases depend on the country of origin of that individual's family. So there is no specific panel except for Persian Jews. Um, a genetic counselor would be very, very helpful to help figure out what to be screened for if you are a Sephardic Jew and which lab to use. Where, next slide, please. Where to go to get screened. There are screening programs like the Victor Center in a number of cities. In Philadelphia, Boston, and Miami, you can go to the Victor Center, the Program for Jewish Genetic Health in New York, the Center for Jewish Genetics in Chicago. But your doctor or genetic counselor can do just as good a job if they are well informed and know what to do. And they can often check back with one of the screening centers to find out how to get the right screening done. There are also now many pan-ethnic panels where they screen not only for Jewish genetic diseases, but a bunch of other diseases. And in those panels, it's really important to make sure you do the hexa enzyme to get proper Tay-Sachs testing. Uh, next slide, please. So a little bit more about Tay-Sachs disease. The gold standard for Tay-Sachs testing is blood hexa levels. This will identify carriers of all ethnicities. And that's important because there's a lot of commingling of ethnic groups today. This standard is agreed upon by all the organizations that talk about Jewish genetic disease or write guidelines like ACOG and ACMG. Important to know that direct-to-consumer testing with online kits on saliva is not accurate for Tay-Sachs disease and will miss carriers, especially if they're not 100% Jewish. Next slide, please. The enzyme that's deficient in Tay-Sachs disease is hexosaminidase A. And in the 1970s, they figured out how to measure Hex A easily and economically, and that's when population screening became available. As I said, it's economical. It can cost less than $50 a sample. Today, DNA testing with a variable number of mutations is available, is available in many labs. The best sensitivity for Tay-Sachs testing really is the enzyme and DNA together, which will give you 98% uh, test detection rate. Um, next slide, please. So the bottom line for Tay-Sachs testing is the Ashkenazi population demographics are changing, with the gene pool being modified. Therefore, you cannot rely on DNA alone on saliva. 
if you do, you'll miss 11.4% of carriers of Ashkenazi Jewish origin. Um, in the pan-ethnic population, the hexa enzyme is essential to detect all carriers of all ethnicities. Next slide, please. Tay-Sachs disease is an interesting disease. Everybody thinks of it as a Jewish genetic disease. It is a known carrier rate that's higher in the Irish, Cajun, and French Canadian populations. In those populations, you should start with hexa enzyme analysis. The Jewish mutations on most, most panels will be useless for multi-ethnic populations, so sequencing will be needed. And sad story, the absence of enzyme testing resulted in a baby with Tay-Sachs being born after IVF when the mom was screened without enzyme. So that should be a lesson for all of us. Uh, so how do you do good screening for Jewish genetic diseases? Informed consent with genetic counseling is important so people understand that when they get the phone call that they're a carrier, that this is not a gloom and doom conversation. It's really a knowledge and empowering conversation. Accurate Tay-Sex testing for blood, the full panel of tests and mutations that, for the conditions that have a high carrier rate in the Ashkenazi population. Uh, the panel should be updated as new tests become available. And we believe that genetic counseling is important with the results. Next slide, please. So how do you interpret these results? If the test is negative, the chance of being a carrier is reduced but not eliminated. There is a residual risk for all of these tests. And in some situations, in the Jewish population in general, you can calculate that risk because you know the carrier rate. In the general population, the residual risk would be more difficult to calculate. If the test is positive, the individual is a carrier and genetic counseling is recommended. Next slide, please. So what if you are a carrier? As we said, carriers are usually unaffected and look no different from anyone else. If you find out you're a carrier today, you're not sicker than you were yesterday. You're just a carrier. And carrier-carrier couples do have options. A genetic counselor can review reproductive options with a couple. Couples will make their own decisions about childbearing based on their own beliefs, but with unbiased information. And carrier couples should know that they can have healthy children of their own. It's also important if you're a carrier to tell your family if you are a carrier, one of your parents is a carrier, so your siblings are at risk to be carriers and your extended family as well. Next slide. Options for carrier couples. Before pregnancy, egg or sperm donation, uh, adoption, and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and uh, with uh, in vitro fertilization. And if you're pregnant already, prenatal testing with chorionic sampling at 10 to 12 weeks or amniocentesis. Next slide, please. Pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is one of the amazing modern advances in fertility and also in genetics, where the egg is fertilized in the lab with in vitro fertilization. At three days when the embryo is eight cells big, they take one cell and do the genetic testing on that one cell. You can only do this if you know what the mutations are. They will then be able to tell you which embryos are unaffected and implant those embryos into the uterus. Insurance may cover. Charities can also help. And the good thing is that rabbis do not object. So in the Jewish community, this is definitely an acceptable option. Next slide, please. Donor egg or donor sperm can be used, but the donor must have been screened for Jewish genetic diseases. You don't want to find another carrier donor if the person is a carrier for that disease. So this is important. Uh, if both parents are carriers, a donor egg or donor sperm could then be used to prevent having an affected child. And it's also a possible choice for same-sex or single parents. Next slide, please. Decision-making by patients is different in each individual, and their perspective and, and approach will based on the different denominations within Judaism. PGD and IVF are OK in all branches of the Jewish religion, and embryos can be discarded. That is an OK thing to do. Some couples will consult with their rabbis, uh, but some people are also very suspicious and have concerns about discrimination. Next slide, please. For this, we have GINA, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. 
It is illegal for health insurance companies or employers to discriminate based on genetic information. <laughs> You're a carrier, though. It really should not be considered genetic information with any implications on health. What is not protected, protected by GINA is your current health status, life insurance, long-term care, and disability insurance. So next slide, please. Where do you get screened? The best time, really, is before marriage and childbearing so that couples have all their reproductive options available to them before getting pregnant. If already pregnant and the couple has not been screened, they should be screened at the same time very, very quickly. Between each pregnancy, updating the screening is also a good idea as new diseases. Next slide, please. A blood test to include Tay-Sachs enzyme as well as DNA for all of the diseases is recommended. And it can be done in your doctor or genetic counselor's office or at one of the screening organizations with informed consent so that the individual understands the consequences of the testing. I personally do not recommend online or direct-to-consumer testing on saliva for obvious reasons, as I have enumerated. So in summary, Ashkenazi Jews have a one in two risk of being a carrier for one or more of the 37 serious autosomal recessive disorders that have a high carrier rate in the Ashkenazi population. Uh, it is possible to be a carrier of many diseases and still be healthy, and we have seen people who are carriers for up to five of these diseases, and they look perfectly fine, and they are fine. Fragile X can be added if requested. More than one out of 100 couples are at 25% risk with each pregnancy for having an affected child. So this is very important information. Carriers are healthy, and carrier couples can seek reproductive options which allow for the birth of a healthy biological child. And knowledge is empowering. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schneider. We're going to have one more polling question before we continue the webinar. Another true or false. Standard SMA testing or detection methods cannot detect silent SMA 2 plus 0 carriers, resulting in false negative results in up to 8% of cases. True or false? True, and 96% of people agree that it's true. Now we'll continue with Dr. Gross. Hello, everybody. Um, on behalf of Natera, I welcome you to our webinar today. And uh, thank you for joining in. And I would particularly like to thank uh, Dr. Schneider. It's really a privilege to have a world expert on the field of carrier screening, uh, particularly in the Ashkenazi Jewish community, join us today. Uh, I learn from you all the time, Adele, and thank you again. Uh, today, what I'm going to speak about is um, the discussion I'm going to expand somewhat beyond uh, Ashkenazi Jewish testing and speak to carrier screening in general and give a little bit of historical context. As you heard, routine screening uh, to start with was really in high-risk ethnic populations since the 1970s. Tay-Sachs, we just heard about, and sickle cell uh, in the African-American community. Historically, screening was based on several principles that have really withstood the test of time. The disorder should be severe. There should be a high carrier frequency, a high disease load coverage, which means that if you screen negative, it is likely you are truly negative. Reliable and accurate assay performance. There should be an intervention that actually clinically matters. The cost should be reasonable to individuals and, in fact, from a public health perspective to society in general, and that genetic counseling and education be available post-test. Next slide, please. And, in fact, this is reflected in our ACOG guidelines uh, that we use every day in our practices. For example, hemoglobinopathy screening, the position statement that states individuals of Southeast Asian, African, or Mediterranean descent are at higher risk of being carriers of hemoglobinopathies, and these patients should be offered carrier screening, which, in fact, does take place across the country every day.
The Ashkenazi Jewish Population Screening Program, there are two guidelines that uh, differ somewhat. ACOG in 2009 reiterated its stance that screening should be offered uh, for four of the major Jewish disorders, Tay-Sachs, Canavan, familial dysautonomia, and cystic fibrosis, uh, and that there are other disorders that can be discussed uh, with your patient. The American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics in 2008 expanded that panel and opted to include disorders that are severe, that really do have high detection rates. Um, and to that end, as you could see, five additional disorders uh, Fanconi, Neiman Pick, Bloom Syndrome, Mucolipidosis 4, and Gaucher were added at that time. Next slide. However, uh, as the title says, it's an ever-changing landscape. And in fact, ethnicity may no longer be the best predictor of carrier status. The U.S. population uh, most certainly has a high ethnic admixture uh, that is increasing all the time. Patients actually may report multiple ethnicities or may unknowingly omit a high-risk ethnicity. So unlike research projects, in our offices, patients essentially are self-reporting. Next slide, please. The cystic fibrosis screening uh, story is really, uh, in many ways, actually monumental in terms of where we started and where we are now. The original NIH consensus statement, and this is back in 1997, uh, came to the conclusion that cystic fibrosis screening should be offered to adults with a positive family history, partners of people with cystic fibrosis, couples currently planning a pregnancy or seeking prenatal diagnosis. So in fact, the original document was quite broad. However, uh, ACOG and ACMG, so our OBGYN Society and Medical Genetic Society, put together a joint statement uh, thereafter that actually uh, pushed back in that if you look at that statement, cystic fibrosis carrier screening should be offered really only to the high-risk population. Those would be Caucasians and Ashkenazi Jews using a universal pan-ethnic core mutation panel of 23. ACOG, however, over the course of time uh, came full circle. It is important that cystic fibrosis screening continue to be offered to women of reproductive age. That's the 2011 statement. And across the country, women are offered cystic fibrosis screening regardless of a priori risk. Next slide. Now, what we saw with cystic fibrosis is a major change. We moved from uh, targeted screening in high-risk populations uh, for several reasons. The major change that came about, of course, is what we discussed, the admixture of the population, the fact that there is self-reporting, um, and that, in fact, all women should have that option to screen in order to identify possible risk in uh, the pregnancy. We now have another seminal moment, and that is technology. Recent technology, such as next-gen sequencing, allows those of us who are in laboratories to test for multiple diseases at the same time for little or no additional cost. And that is really very important because if we think about it, it affects every single aspect of some of those initial points that I talked about at the beginning, when and how to screen. And the fact is that just because we can do more tests more easily at cheaper cost, does that mean that we should screen for everything or have these expanded panels? And really, when you speak to professionals, and I believe if you speak to patients um, and the community at large, we still need clinical criteria for choosing what should be on a responsible carrier panel. Next slide. So to that end, uh, really it's the introduction uh, to the rest of my talk, which is how uh, we do offer responsible carrier screening. So when we ask ourselves, why not screen for everything? We could. Um, however, let's think about it. If we have these very large extended panels, we may be including dis disorders that are not severe and in fact may be treatable. These may be disorders that are not appropriate for prenatal carrier screening family planning. We may be testing for disorders that have low detection rates and do not significantly lower risk. In other words, if you really can't detect 
uh, most carriers, even if you are negative, you are likely still not at decreased risk than when you started. You can also end up providing overwhelming amounts of complex information, and especially in pregnancy, you could end up delivering results that are ambiguous or uninformative, and it always comes back to the same principle that many of us when we entered medical school, uh, we still live by, which is first, do no harm. Next slide, please. So let's give a case example. This is a disorder, Hurlitz Junctional Epidermolysis Bullosa, uh, that can be found uh, on some of these expanded panels. Now, this is an extraordinarily rare disorder, albeit life-threatening. Uh, many cases, if not most, are fatal, uh, where the skin is simply so fragile that you end up with chronic blistering, um, multiple infections, and often present at birth. However, it's so rare, it's actually less than one in a million, and an ethnic carrier rate of less than one in 500, and it may be even less than that. So let's walk through. Let's say somebody's 28 years old, pregnant, and found to be a carrier. You bring in the partner, you have a genetic counseling session, and the partner is offered the same carrier panel and is negative. However, the fact that this person, uh, the partner, is negative, that means the residual risk may only be minimally reduced because, in fact, only 10% of those carriers would be detected using this methodology. Next slide, please. So this comes back to a fundamental principle. We always talk about carrier screening, but in fact, the reason we do carrier screening in pregnancy is we actually are interested in not just determining if someone is a carrier. What we care about is what is the risk to the fetus. It's really all about the pregnancy. So going back to our case at hand, the couple's residual risk to have a child with this particular disorder is actually less than one in 2,000. However, we've all been there. The couple may be sitting in our office still very concerned, even if it is less than 1 in 2,000 and they want further testing. But prenatal diagnosis is not available unless both parents have known mutations. There is another option. Uh, the father could perhaps pay out of pocket for full sequencing of the gene. And let's say we go ahead and do that. Now we find a variant of uncertain significance, and the parents are left without clear knowledge of whether their child is at risk for the disorder, incredible anxiety, and what should have been a normal pregnancy now is going to have a cloud right up until the moment of delivery. Next slide. So, this does not mean that I am suggesting that technology is bad, it is wrong, or even dangerous. On the contrary, what makes a responsible carrier panel is to use the most current science, attach that to the most current technology, and hopefully in that way prevent disease and ensure the birth of healthy children. Next slide. So let's look at the Horizon Carrier Screen, uh, which is the uh, program that has been released uh, by Natera and is now available. So I'd like to give you some background for how we made the decisions we made as to what disorders actually would appear in the Horizon Carrier Screen. So first of all, let's look at diseases and mutations. They need to be severe with neonatal or early childhood onset systemic disease that may cause significant morbidity or even mortality, that there is no cure available. We are looking for high carrier rates in at least one ethnic group. High detection rates are important, and it is actionable. There is something that can be done. There's also an additional advantage. Because Natera is actually a very broad com uh, company, for example, we are speaking about carrier screening today. Many, uh, many in the community know us as the company that provides Panorama, which is our non-invasive non prenatal testing program. But we also have a pre-implantation genetic test. And if we know the exact mutations, IVF actually is an option there. Next slide, please. So let's talk about Natera's Horizon Carrier Screen. Next slide. 
So we include all the diseases recommended by the ACMG and ACOG on our standard panel with options for Horizon AJ, Ashkenazi Jewish Plus panel, with additional diseases recommended by Victor Center. And you just heard uh, from Dr. Schneider previously. Um, also, there is an Atera philosophy here. And uh, I mentioned it in the previous slide, but I would like you to bear this in mind as we continue uh, towards the end of the talk. The idea being that we remain dynamic. We upgrade panels as updated recommendations from respective professional groups become available. Next slide, please. So in this new uh, panel that we have, there are standalone options, and the panels include diseases and mutations, as mentioned from ACOG, ACMG, and Victor Center. Uh, there are, as you can see, six bullets uh, and updates. I am going to uh, review them uh, going forward. Each of these disorders, of course, are worthy of their own webinar. And if you do have any further questions related to the disorders, any way we can help you at all, and certainly with the carrier panel, uh, we will be available uh, after the webinar. Please communicate and contact us. Uh, we would be more than delighted uh, to discuss these with you in further depth. Next slide, please. So let's start with cystic fibrosis. Um, and again, that is really uh, the major paradigm shift in carrier screening uh, it was cystic fibrosis. And we started with the 23 ACMG recommended mutations. Uh, we are now up to 127 cystic fibrosis mutations. Uh, mutations that are added are the classic form or childhood onset with pulmonary involvement. We did not include mild adult onset um, or those that would really be about reduced uh, male fertility. Uh, rather than the uh, classic form. The expanded panel uh, that we have is all about increased detection rates, and especially in Hispanic and African Americans. And we have to remember how old this program actually is. And as we did more and more population screening, we did find mutations that are important in populations beyond Ashkenazi Jewish population and Caucasians. Next slide, please. We have Fragile X Syndrome. It is also on the panel. Next slide, please. Um, now, ACMG and ACOG uh, both do discuss Fragile X carriers in various statements. And, the, um, and they both agree, as opposed to some of the other issues we're going to discuss today, that this should be offered to women with a family history of Fragile X-related disorders unexplained mental retardation, or what we would say cognitive disability, developmental delay, autism or premature ovarian insufficiency. The reason that these two uh, bodies have not come out for broad-based carrier screening is that there is a complexity, that if you carry a premutation, and we'll discuss this shortly, you are actually at increased risk yourself as a carrier of having an adult onset condition, such as Fragile X-associated tremor ataxia syndrome or premature ovarian failure. Next slide, please. Having said that, there has been uptake throughout the country for Fragile X, and the reason is that there is a carrier rate of 1 in 259 or greater. It's a severe disorder with no cure. It is actionable with prenatal diagnosis, PGD, other family planning options, and there really now is a fast, accurate, and low-cost carrier screen. Next slide. The underlying mechanism is fascinating. It's what we call a trinucleotide repeat, where there are three bases, in this case CGG. And these repeats, they occur in all of us. We all have them. And the expansion of the CGG repeats within the gene occurs when the gene is inherited through the mother. So again, this is easily a talk in itself, but the bottom line is the table that you see. We all have these repeats. Normal is less than 45. You go through different gradations, intermediate, permutation carrier, and if you expand beyond 200, you have the full mutation and the uh, fragile X syndrome. Next slide, please. Now the um, issue here is that as the mutation or premutation, as you go through those gradations, your risk to full expansion actually increases. Uh, what we are learning through very good science is that, in fact, this may be related uh, to AGG, three base pairs that basically serve as anchors uh, in that region. 
So the Horizon Fragile X Carrier Screening includes this AGG reflex testing for all results showing premutation in intermediate sized alleles between 45 and 90 CGG repeats. Next slide, please. So the science has actually been around for several years that these uh, AGG, uh, these the triple base pair AGG serves, uh, as I like to say, as anchors. Uh, that they, they stabilize those regions. Next slide, please. And here is a very nice cartoon that uh, makes it very clear. You can see the AGG in the red box there. And if you have these anchors, they basically stabilize uh, the area. And uh, sometimes they're referred to it like street bumps and they slow down the expansion. So if they are present, they actually reduce your risk. They certainly refine your risk. Next slide, please. In spinal muscular atrophy, this is another disorder that we have on the panel. Next slide. And this is a severe disorder, autosomal recessive. There are various forms, uh, but it actually uh, mirrors cystic fibrosis in that there is a frequency that is relatively quite common in the population at 1 in 50 and a prevalence of 1 in 10,000. Uh, what we now know because of the uptake of uh, SMA uh, screening, there does seem to be a difference depending uh, on one's race and ethnicity. But as you can see, the numbers are really all within range of what many of the carrier uh, screening program guidelines would consider a relatively high frequency. Uh, disorder. Next slide, please. And it is actually very interesting. The American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics in 2008 felt that SMA fits criteria. Uh, it's pan-ethnic, a high carrier rate, high detection rate, greater than 90 percent will be detected, and that it is a severe disease. ACOG, however, uh, the following year, felt that this was not yet the time to recommend SMA screening for all, and that the following recommendations uh, should be in place first, of having pilot programs, cost-effectiveness analysis, educational materials, and uh, lab standards in place. Next slide, please. Having said that, SMA really has become uh, part of care in uh, many practices throughout the country. And it is also a very interesting disorder because of the underlying mechanism. Uh, there is a small percentage of cases that are related to point mutations. However, the vast majority are related to having uh, a whole exon that is missing, exon 7 to be precise in this gene. And if you have three copies, you have a significantly reduced carrier risk. If you have two copies, one on each chromosome, the one you inherited from your mom and one from your dad, reduced carrier risk. Only one copy um, where you are missing that exon, and that is the person that we report as an SMA carrier. Next slide. But here is the issue that has been a conundrum uh, for us for many years. I just said that if you have two copies, as you can see, one on each chromosome, you're going to be a non-carrier when it comes to this particular uh, mechanism, that of missing uh, exon 7. But if, let's say, we screen an individual and we say, hey, there's two copies, that's great. How do we not know that the situation is not that that we see in the cartoon on the right hand of the screen. How do we not know that, in fact, this person is a silent carrier? Both of the copies ended up on the same chromosome, and this person actually has a 50% chance of passing along a chromosome where the exon is not present. Next slide, please. We now know, again, thanks to an excellent paper uh, from the Mount Sinai Genetics Testing Laboratory uh, that was recently published, that there's a single nucleotide polymorphism uh, in intron 7 that is associated with two copies on the same chromosome. In other words, it's a marker that there is a real chance that this is a silent carrier, that the, this individual has um, a situation uh, that the copies um, are, in fact, um, if the SNP is present, then the copies 
are related and are associated with two copies on the same chromosome. So the other interesting thing in this paper is that this was very much related to the African American community. So to reiterate, if the SNP is present, then an African American who is um, gets a report with two copies has an increased carrier risk from 1 in 121 to 1 in 34. In fact, it's signaling that both of the um, both of these uh, exons are actually on the same chromosome. If the SNP is not there, then in fact the African American residual risk can be decreased from 1 in 121 to 1 in 396. So again, to reiterate, in this situation, that SNP is present, it is associated with two copies of the SMN1 gene on the same chromosome. And it is really, uh, for uh, carrier screening, a breakthrough, particularly for the African American population. Next slide, please. So we're just going to review, to wrap up, what panels are available. The Horizon Standard Panel includes panethnic disorders, cystic fibrosis, fragile X, spinal muscular atrophy, as well as the Ashkenazi Jewish Panel, which is the ACMG panel, plus glycogen storage disease, and, of course, uh, the Tay-Sachs enzyme test. Next slide, please. The Horizon HA panel that includes 20 disorders is the Victor 19, um, as well as Fragile X, which was also discussed uh, in our previous uh, discussion with Dr. Schneider. Next slide. And uh, Again, you heard this in the previous discussion, but following an oral uh, presentation by the Mount uh, Sinai uh, Laboratory, there is now an expanded panel for Ashkenazi Jewish population uh, that is the Ashkenazi Jewish 38 expanded panel. Next slide. Uh, here you can see the list of disorders that we now include. But the most important point to be made here is we still hold true to the principles that opened up this talk. And that is that we want detection rates that are high and disorders that are truly severe. And these disorders that you see on the slide really do meet those criteria. Next slide. Now what about hemoglobinopathy? So we can close out the talk and come back full circle. Next slide. It is still the gold standard to offer quantitative hemoglobin electrophoresis and CBC uh, screening tests. It identifies carriers of alpha and beta thal, sickle cell and other clinically significant hemoglobin variants, and has a greater coverage and higher detection rate than DNA-based hemoglobinopathy carrier screening. And I'd like to reiterate the point that this goes back to genetic dogma, DNA to RNA to protein. And this is really what we are looking at. We are looking at the end game in this case, and that is actually the protein analysis. Um, and again, ACOG definitely recommends screening of high-risk populations. Gold standard is hemoglobin electrophoresis and CBC screening. Next slide. So let's wrap up with highlights and summary. The horizon carrier screen Again, using the, pan, using the principles that we laid out at the beginning of the talk, we target severe disease mutations. 127 cystic fibrosis mutations improve sensitivity, especially uh, when we move in populations beyond Caucasians. Fragile X carrier screening, uh, if positive results, we reflex to the AGG testing, which will refine risk. The SMA test, we can do copy numbers, uh, of the exons and the genes, and the option for enhanced SMA SNP to increase sensitivity or refine residual carrier risks, as discussed, that the SNPs can help inform whether or not the exons are present on the same chromosome. Ashkenazi Jewish Plus panel includes 20 diseases, the three panethnic plus the 17 uh, Ashkenazi Jewish disorders with Tay-Sachs en Tay enzyme options, an extended Ashkenazi Jewish panel, which includes 38 diseases for patients that want more comprehensive coverage. Next slide, please. Support for providers. 
that really matters. This is a comprehensive screening program. It's not just a lab test. There is somebody else and there is a patient that is associated with each tube of blood. That's really the person who matters. Um, so we have clear reporting with no ambiguous results, complementary genetic counselor patient support, as some of these disorders truly can be uh, somewhat complex, we are there to help. And as mentioned before, we do have that option of single gene spectrum PGD for at-risk couples uh, that we can help you with as well. Essentially, uh, the last line you see is what this is. It's custom pre-implantation genetic uh, disease testing for the mutations that can be developed by Natera. It is a diagnostic test. Next slide. How do you order? It's a simple blood draw, testing requisition form. The collection kits are provided directly to the clinic and can be stored on site. Draw blood, complete the referral and ship, and we have a network of over 1,000 draw sites nationwide. Results are within 10 business days or less. Next slide, please. We also have the option of combining non-invasive prenatal testing and IPT as early as nine weeks with the Horizon Carrier screen. Next slide. And again, what we are trying to promote here is a comprehensive uh, approach to prenatal testing and care. Uh, and I'd like to thank you again for listening in. Uh, that uh, concludes my portion of the talk, and I believe we have some time for questions. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Gross. One last polling question, true or false? Carrier screening for cystic fibrosis should be offered to Caucasians only. Good news, everyone answered the answer false, which is correct. Contact information for Natera is up, and we do have a few minutes for questions and answers, so I'll ask Dr. Schneider and Dr. Gross to chime in. One of the questions relates to TAFAC, so maybe Dr. Schneider, this is a great question for you. What are the influences of pregnancy on HEXA results? If someone is pregnant, doing serum HEXA will not be a reliable test. You have to do it on white blood cells, and you're more likely to get an inconclusive, but that's the better way to do it. Um, if the person is 100% Ashkenazi Jewish, and you do the enzyme and the DNA, you'll get a, a good detection rate on that. If they're not 100% Ashkenazi Jewish, then you might end up with an inconclusive HEXA enzyme, and you might have to go to sequencing. But that's kind of extreme. If they have a partner, test the partner. If the partner is not a carrier, then you can wait till the after that pregnancy and test the patient again. Thank you. One other question about TAFACs. This one, I think, is for Dr. Gross and Barb, if you're available and able to step in also. So since HEXA is a crucial part of TAFAC screening, will HEXA be included in the Terra's panel? And as a secondary portion of that screening, can HEXA be ordered alone for pan-ethnic populations, especially Irish? Um, this is Barb, and I'm the clinical director at Natera. And at this point, HEX-A for TASEX enzyme testing is available as an optional checkbox. So you just check it if you want it um, as part of the panel. And um, uh, that is because there are many, many people of Jewish ancestry that have already been tested with enzyme analysis. And if they have those results, uh, in written form that say negative, there's no need to redo them. But uh, it is available to anybody, and we do recommend it for anyone that has not had prior HEXA uh, enzyme analysis and does not have that piece of paper saying negative in their hands. Great. Yeah, so thank you, Barb. Um, you know, I think that makes it very clear. It is the test for Tay-Sachs. The only reason not to do it is it's already been done uh, previously. And I would like to reiterate, sometimes people will come to the office and say, oh, I had it done and it was okay. 
Um, certainly for those uh, providers who are listening in, please always get written documentation. Um, we've all, like I might have mentioned before, we've all been there uh, where you know patients really were quite convinced that they had one test but they had another. Um, so please make sure, as Barb said, you actually have documentation. Thanks. And then Dr. Schneider, do you want to make a comment about TSACs in the Irish population? Yes. We have encountered a number of babies with TSACs in the last few years who are all of Irish uh, origin. And at Einstein in Philadelphia, we are doing a research study on TSACs in the Irish, trying to establish a carrier rate uh, in individuals who have three Irish grandparents or more. So if you have patients who fulfill that and who are interested, you can email us at irish at tasex.org or go onto the Albert Einstein uh, Philadelphia website and just put in TASEX and you'll get our contact information because we are looking for more participants in the study. Great. There was a question about whether or not Nutera will be offering the screening for all 37 of the HA diseases as was discussed on the webinar. Um, we would be happy to send that reference. Um, so, um, Melissa, if we can get that person's email address, we'll send that out. Absolutely. And yes, Natera will be offering screening for all of these disorders. And there's one question just for information about Fragile X. Sue, would you mind giving just a brief, maybe one or two sentence overview of what Fragile X is? Fragile X is a uh, disorder. Um, and I'm sorry, it was, uh, again, because of limitation of time, uh, we couldn't go into detail. But Fragile X is a disorder that on the X chromosome, uh, we have, as I mentioned, these repeats that are uh, absolutely normal, um, but if the repeats get too, uh, there are too many of these trinucleotide repeats, they shut down a very important gene that is uh, related primarily to uh, cognitive disability. However, uh, these children can also have other, uh, other abnormalities uh, as well in terms of, um, in, in terms of certain physical characteristics. It is really the cognitive disability uh, that remains the biggest issue. Um, and it's more profound in boys because there's only one X chromosome and there's not another X chromosome uh, to make up for the deficiency of that particular protein product. Uh, however, you can see fragile X in uh, girls um, and women as well. Uh, it is a very, very important cause of, uh, of cognitive uh, disability and that we do have the ability to screen for now. Okay. Do you want to add to that, uh, Adele? Just one comment. Uh, fragile X is also a frequent cause of autism. It's one of the few that you can actually detect with a simple test to know that that is the cause of that child's autism. And there are uh, different treatments that they are trying now to help these children function better, and some have been relatively successful. Okay, I think we're at the top of the hour. We want to thank our presenters today, Dr. Gross and Dr. Schneider, for being with us. And we want to thank everyone who's attended for listening in and being a part of our Natera webinar. For those of you who did not get your questions answered, we will be sure to reach out to each of you individually. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.